I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, this is unusual. The Israeli Defense Forces have just released footage of Israel's pre-dawn airstrikes against Iranian and Syrian military sites in southern Syria. The attack came in response to the discovery of a number of explosive devices that were planted in the Israeli Golan Heights, and the Syria State News Agency says that three military personnel have been killed and one has been wounded. The Israeli military claims that the IDF attacked eight targets, including Iranian headquarters at the Damascus International Airport, a secret military site that has served as a hosting facility for senior Iranian delegations when they come to Syria to operate. Well, we have Benham Ben Taleblu joining us. He is uh, joining us all the way from Washington, D.C. So first of all, Benham, explain what kinds of explosive devices were planted in the Israeli Golan Heights. Well, great to be back with you. We know that Iran has trafficked a whole different series of munitions, and in fact, electro-optical devices to help make uh, the rockets of its uh, partners and Israel's adversaries in the region into missiles. Uh, but Iran is actually also trafficking ammunition, uh, as well as uh, various kinds of explosives. So it's not clear the exact type of explosive, but basically anything that is combustible, anything that can go boom, that could be used by the Assad regime, that could be used by Palestinian terrorists, and most importantly, by Iran's most successful proxy, Lebanese Hezbollah. Um, so Iran has used this supply route before, but moving them over uh, into the Israeli part of the border is a very risk-tolerant move. Now, this is certainly not the first time that Israel has struck Iranian targets in Syria and those of allied militias, including Lebanon's Hezbollah. How deeply entrenched is Iran in Syria, and why? In many ways, you could say they're almost part and parcel of the Assad regime. Iran received critical support from uh, the Syrian dictator's father, Hafez al-Assad, during the 1980-1988 Iran-Iraq war. And that helped to wed these two regimes together for a very long time. If there was no Syria, there would be no Lebanese Hezbollah today. And as I recently said, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah is Iran's most important and most successful proxy. And when uh, the current Syrian dictator was in battle, Lebanese Hezbollah was the one who entered the battle space and helped win the day. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. Syria permits Iran uh, to engage in these kind of offensive activities on its own soil. And that's why you've seen this steady uptick of IDF activities to try to roll back this Iranian encroachment uh, in the Levant. Well, it's interesting because it does seem that Israel has stepped up strikes in Syria this year specifically against Iranian targets. Why do you think that's the case? And does it have anything to do with Washington, D.C.'s backing? 
Well, it seems like Washington is okay with this because in many ways Washington has been derelict in finding a way to roll back Iran's activities in the region. Uh, when you survey the Middle East more broadly, Israel has been the most successful actor um, uh, at impeding Iran's growth of assets, infrastructure, military capabilities, and, and select precision-guided munitions uh, in places like Syria. So really, if Israel wasn't doing this, the Iranian threat would be multiple-fold uh, in the Levant, whether that was in Syria or in Lebanon. Iran has what we like to call a land bridge connecting itself to Iraq, to Syria, to Lebanon. And it's across this bridge that key personnel, uh, key men, and money actually travel. So Israel has been significantly stepping up its activities here, likely because Iran has been significantly trying to grow uh, the capabilities of this land bridge. Well, you know, it's it's certainly a rare move for the IDF to release footage of these serious strikes. What kind of response could Israel expect to see, if anything? Well, sometimes when Israel does tip its hand uh, in relation to uh, some of these strikes, uh, the Iranians do back down for a while. Or when they do try to respond, they respond and they fail and they have to go back and lick their wounds. We saw this, I think, in a, in a cycle in 2018 and once in 2019. Uh, but as Israel becomes more willing to show to the international community and not just to the region the military capabilities it has, as well as the need to have to do this because Iran keeps encroaching uh, on Israel's borders, uh, that should be much of an alarm bell, and unfortunately, it isn't going off for many. Are we on the verge of the biblical doom of Damascus spoken of in Isaiah 17? Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9, in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow in an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. This morning, new details about dramatic military action nearly taken by President Trump with only two months left in his term. ABC News has confirmed that Trump asked his senior advisors last week for options on attacking Iran's main nuclear site after a report detailed how the Iranians are increasing their stockpile of nuclear material. Before the proverbial link was even dry on the Iranian nuclear deal signed in 2015, Iran has pushed its limits. Slow but consistent breaching of the limitations that Iran took upon itself when it signed the JCPOA in the summer of 2015. Now, it's doing it step by step. While misbehavior like that led President Trump to pull out of the international agreement, Iran's tactics seem to be working. The most recent report of the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency discovered Iran now has 12 times the amount of low enriched uranium allowed by the so-called deal. According to the Institute for Science and International Security, Iran's estimated breakout time as of late September 2020 is as short as three and a half months. That time frame would be early 2021, but that element is just the first of two steps towards a nuclear weapon. The other point is how to assemble a nuclear device. It's not the same. How you um, create the device to start the nuclear uh, Reaction. That makes the major question, how long would it take for Iran to have a nuclear bomb? I would say that if Iran decides that it puts away all kind of international spectrum oversight considerations and, and go fast forward, then Iran can become nuclear, fully nuclear, meaning with the ability to put a bomb on a missile, etc., between three and five years. Chris Mitchell is with us now, directly from Jerusalem. And Chris, you've got to wonder, where did the huge amounts of this uranium, where did this come from? That's right, uh, uh, Gordon, exactly. Uh, they really have gone m far beyond what the Iranian nuclear deal says. And let me just give you a little bit of news right here. Uh, just a few hours ago, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo landed here in Israel. He's meeting with the Bahraini delegation, which came here as well. That's the first. And also with uh, Israeli Prime Minister. Why that's relevant right now is that all three countries, Israel, Bahrain, and the U.S., are deeply involved in whether or not Iran will get a nuclear bomb. And to your question, how did they do that? 
that? Well, they do that step by step, as uh, Ronald Bergman said in our report. Now they have about 5,000 pounds of enriched uranium to about 3.5%. And what that means, Gordon, is that it doesn't take them long to get to 90%, which is weapons grade. That's how the physics works. And if they and in the report it said, you know, maybe three and a half months. That's what it means. They would be about three and a half months by taking that 5,000 pounds of enriched uranium and making it nuclear grade, at least for one nuclear device. Uh, I can kind of predict uh, what uh, officials in the Obama administration are going to say on this, that it was a mistake to back out of the Iranian deal. Is that true? Was that a strategic mistake to, to back out of that? Uh, I, I wouldn't say so uh, from my understanding of the n Iranian nuclear deal, and certainly that's not what President Trump and his foreign policy advisors thought. The reason for that is that the Iranian nuclear deal had several flaws in it. Uh, first of all, it never addressed ballistic missiles, which is probably why it, how Iran would get a nuclear device here to Israel. The other thing, it had a sunset clause. It meant that after 25 years, for some of the uh, regular stipulations, even five, five years or 10 for some of those regulations, so it was going to run out anyway. And the other thing, uh, it never allowed inspectors to go to, to military sites. That's a major flaw because some of the nuclear research going on that they found in those atomic archives was happening in these uh, mis these nuclear sites, these uh, military sites. So I, I would say, uh, based on what President Trump has done, many of the uh, analysts that we talk to here in Israel would say that the nuclear deal, the JCOPA, as they call it, is uh, was flawed from the very beginning. All right, well, let's talk about solutions now. Uh, I think underlying the Abraham Accords with the UAE, with Bahrain, uh, there's an attempt to form an alliance that's actually aimed against Iran and its ambitions in the regions. Do, do you think Saudi Arabia is going to join in, in with that? Could there actually be a coalition that, that coalesces now to say uh, we need to stand against Iran and make sure that they never get a nuclear weapon? I think so, uh, uh, Gordon. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, people have wondered what happens if Joe Biden becomes president or President Trump remains president. And you can look at it either way. If, uh, if Joe Biden did become president, there might be an even added incentive for Saudi Arabia to go ahead, strike a deal with, uh, with Israel because it normalized relations with Israel because they still see Iran as maybe even a greater threat. And if President Trump stays in and the Abraham Accords, I think would just continue to expand. Uh, we have heard from the uh, uh, U.S. Am ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, that there's five or ten nations literally waiting in line to become, uh, and we would expect Saudi Arabia would be one of them. And to your point, it would all be part of an alliance that would uh, be Israel and all these Sunni Arab nations against a bold Iran that may eventually get a nuclear weapon. Well, we were fairly close to war. I, I remember Iran shooting down one of our drones and then uh, a proportionate strike back, and I think John Bolton wanted us to actually launch a war against Iran. He, he uh, was overruled by the president. Um, uh, how likely is it if, if this uranium your, your enrichment continues to go forward, how likely are we going to see an actual attack either by Israel or by the U.S.? What, what form would it take and what kind of escalation could we expect afterwards? Yeah, first of all, Gordon, I think the first thing would be whether or not uh, Iran will enrich that 3.5 uh, enriched uranium to 90 percent. If they go ahead with that, that would signal to the world that Iran is going to go get a nuclear device. And I think that would be the point where Israel, the U.S., or other nations would calculate an attack uh, uh, on, a, uh, on Iran. It's a very formidable uh, prospect if they do that, because the Iranian facilities are spread out around the country. Many of them are underground, so it's very challenging for the IDF. However, the IDF has been preparing for this for decades. Uh, we know that uh, they have the F-35, they have F-16s, they have drones, they have special operations that could be uh, all be part of an attack on Iran. 
And to your point as well, what would happen? What would be the retaliation? Well, that's something the IDF has to prepare for as well. For what's happening up on Hezbollah has about 150,000 rockets aimed at Israel on its northern border. Hamas has thousands on its southern border. So if Israel attacks or a co coordination of nations attack Iran, you would expect that Iran's going to retaliate with their own uh, attacks as well, perhaps. We were in Saudi Arabia uh, last September when uh, Iran attacked uh, the Aramco facility. It's the largest oil refining facility in Saudi Arabia. They use a calculation of uh, a combination of drones and missiles. In just about 18 minutes, they literally shut that facility down. So Iran has a formidable arsenal they can use if they're attacked. And if they're attacked, uh, uh, Gordon, we're going to see, uh, we don't know what we're going to see in the, uh, in, the, in the region, but it could be a, a wide regional war. Just in about the last week and a half, Gordon, they've come out with what they call a ballistic missile train, literally where they have several missiles on one train that they can uh, launch at once. And that's very difficult for Israel because they do have probably this, the world's state-of-the-art anti-missile system. They have the arrow, they have David's sling, and they have the Iron Dome. But if they have multiple missiles coming at one time, be very difficult to... Uh, uh, to stop them. And finally, uh, Gordon, the last point, I guess, would be that the atomic archives proved that Iran was building a nuclear device. They had all the technology, they had all the knowledge, and uh, it's just a matter of time, many people believe, before they can get that, the, combined with the enriched uranium and a ballistic missile, to pose a threat to Europe, Israel, and the world. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49.36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? Turkey is the emerging uh, major threat to the Middle East. Analysts like Seth Fransman say we are witnessing a belligerent Turkey on the move. It's invaded and ethnically cleansed Afrin of, of Kurds and Yazidis and Christians. It attacked uh, last year in eastern Syria and attacked and ethnically cleansed Christians. It's attacked Armenian now. Uh, it didn't do it directly, but it, it basically goaded the Azerbaijanis into war. And it's also been involved in Libya. It sent Syrian mercenaries. Also, Turkey's been threatening Greece every few weeks for the last six months. Also, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, the UAE. I mean, it never stops. One advance came after a deal with Libya 
for its water rights in the Mediterranean Sea. And the whole point of the deal was to basically use a very poor and weak uh, Libyan divided government and get a deal for all this water rights, which basically mean that Turkey is now sitting astride what claims by Greece and the pipeline that Israel wants to build. Erdogan telegraphed his intent to the world by converting the Hagia Sophia, once the largest church in Christendom, into a mosque. Ever since the modern nation state in 1923, that church has you know, been a museum basically mm -hmm. and free for everyone to gather in. Him just making the decision to turn it back into a mosque basically is a indirect kind of communication to everybody. I want to restore our Ottoman past. After that conversion, Erdogan set his sights on liberating the Al-Aqsa Mosque here in Jerusalem. Then last month he said, in this city that we had to leave in tears during the First World War, it is still possible to come across traces of the Ottoman resistance. So Jerusalem is our city. Fransman says the regional powerhouses of Turkey and Iran share the same goals. I think it's just that you just have to, we have to admit the rhetoric from Ankara today is a rhetoric that looks exactly like the Iranian regime rhetoric. And that's, by the way, exactly what the UAE and other friends, I think, of the US and Israel say, which is that Iran and Turkey are on the same side. It's not the Persian Ottoman Empire, Sunni and Shia. They're both religious extremism. And then the rest, there's other countries in the region that are not that. Erdogan's aggression presents another problem. Turkey is a NATO member, but isn't seen as a team player. Recently, it purchased Russia's S-400 anti-aircraft missile system and aligns itself with the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. It's connected deeply into the European NATO security infrastructure. And I think that, that presents a huge challenge. And I don't know how uh, countries are going to extricate themselves. It's a regime seen as hostile to Christians. Two years ago, Turkish officials convicted and then released American pastor Andrew Brunson on charges of aiding terrorism. Now, Middle East analyst Mike Karam tells CBN News Turkey is closing its doors. Basically, his goal to cleanse Turkey of all, you know, non-Turkish Christians, any Protestant foreign Christians that are living, working in the land or involved with the Turkish church at all, they've been declared persona non grata and a threat to national order or threat to, threat to national security. Given its dreams of a neo-Ottoman empire and Turkish nationalism, some believe Turkey might be as much of a threat to the West as Iran. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, Stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18-23, and 39-2, 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, 
and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, you touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Stay tuned as we watch Bible prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance 
is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.